have since I, Brian, you asked me to kick it off. I, um, I'd like to welcome you all um, um, to the presentation for, um, from the administration about um, the transition piece um, as things begin to open up. The Senate has had a lot of questions and we thought that we would gather everybody here to um, start off and have you as things open up, um, tell us what's going to happen and what we should expect and where we might go with questions is always good. Um, and um, with that, We'll, um, um, I think you should go ahead. If I could just add just one thing, just a reminder for folks that came on late, we're gonna hold all of our questions to the until the end to give everyone an opportunity to speak. Um, and we did uh, share some broad questions uh, and concerns with um, the administration that they, so hopefully a lot will be covered that people have sort of been on people's minds. So thank you. Commissioner. Great, so I'll kick it off and the, the tentative uh, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety and uh, the run of show will be, I'll give an overview. Uh, Secretary Smith will walk through an example of one of the, of the restart uh, operations on the AHS side. Secretary Curley will walk through one uh, on the commerce and community development side. And then Drs. Levine and Kelso uh, will provide uh, the uh, healthcare, medical, scientific, uh, components of, of how all of this work in, in greater detail. Um, there is a system and a flow to what we've developed. And uh, while we have a few of the executives on the call today, there are teams of dozens of people that are supporting this effort. And there are folks out in industry, uh, in various sectors, uh, businesses, nonprofits, uh, all helping to support um, the work that's going on relative to Restart. Uh, it all starts with data. Uh, we have a variety of dashboards that have been built. We have data that's modeled on a daily basis, uh, sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, the types of things that are, are modeled, many of them you're aware of from um, illness to hospitalizations, ICU capacity, uh, ventilator use, um, our uh, personal protective equipment stock and what we uh, are both confident and uh, question uh, what's inbound at any given time. Our medical surge capacity, uh, we have expanding data sets beyond just Vermont at this point. We are beginning over the last few days. Uh, Commissioner Pichek's team and the team led by uh, Kristen McClure, the state's chief data officer, are now modeling uh, regional trends and data to see how things look adjacent to us to help inform some of the decisions that are made. Uh, we look at not only data that the state's got and, and models there, but also um, data that's available to us that maps other things like the mobility of Vermonters. Um, we can even see a little bit of granular detail around uh, physical distancing and, and the impacts of that uh, year over year uh, based on, on certain metrics. There are, uh, you hear a lot about thresholds that have been um, created. We do have four minimally viable thresholds that we've created to, to enable decision-making, but those are just sort of the base level. They're not, um, they're not an if we cross this particular line, then we trigger a particular thing. Those are where um, the baseline for conversation begins. Um, and as a, a side note, and uh, Dr. Levine and Kelso can talk more about this, but we have passed the four quote unquote gating criteria of downward trends that allow us to contemplate various components of restart. In addition to the data that we're tracking, uh, Commissioner Pichek's team um, also cross checks with external models and scientists, including Northeastern University, uh, IHME, um, data that's available from RT Live, and uh, other data sets as they become available. Um, as you've all probably noticed, um, and the, any public folks that are, are watching, there's, there's more data available on an ongoing basis as this unfolds. The Agency of Human Services and the Department of Health have been focused on increasing our testing capabilities and contact tracing capabilities over the last few weeks. Um, we believe those are fairly robust now with large numbers of tests uh, available. Uh, and a, a robust plan for contact tracing should that become necessary. Those are components of the uh, decision-making process around restart as well. In addition to that, there are um, illness monitoring systems that are already in place. So the health department can see who's presenting on any given day with symptoms 
that match something that could be a, a COVID-like illness, that kind of syndromic surveillance that you hear Dr. Levine talk about with some frequency that is built in to the data metrics and this process as well. And then there is a workflow. And the, the crux of the beginning of the workflow is that we made a decision early on to try to uh, frame the restart decisions around how cross sections of the workforce and how businesses work rather than trying to take them one by one with hundreds or thousands of different NAICS codes for types of sectors, because that would be uh, even more complicated than a process that's fairly complicated to start with. Um, so flowing from there, the process involves multiple meetings each week, at least one every day. Um, the nomination process for restart, if you will, can come from a lot of different arenas, but typically comes either from the healthcare sector or the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, and it goes on to a workflow document. The uh, role of the Department of Public Safety and the Emergency Operations Center is really to act uh, in really a moderating kind of uh, capacity for, for flow as uh, the Agency of Commerce is uh, immersed in the, the ongoing business conversations and the Department of Health obviously is uh, quarterbacking the, the health response and the data associated with that. So from there, uh, in that moderating role, it goes to the, the Department of Health for review. Um, there are multiple sessions typically with each phase of restart where things are discussed among all of the, the parties on the, on the restart teams. And then once the guidance and the timing uh, has recommendations that are finalized, it goes to the governor for review and then potential inclusion into a weekly either executive order update if it's necessary or guidance issued um, in conjunction with that executive order or in some cases guidance that just updates prior guidance uh, from the Agency of Commerce uh, issued by Secretary Curley. Um, there is a parallel process to that within human services for uh, key things that exist in their uh, sphere of influence, like healthcare system restart, childcare, and things of that nature. Then it all goes back to the data. And uh, not that it stops and starts, but um, the data is sort of woven into everything. But we go back to the beginning and we see uh, after a, a certain cross section of restart uh, decisions are made, what does the data look like? What additional data is available? And we go from there. Um, that's the overview of the process at a, a sort of a super high level. And from there, I turn it over to Secretary Smith uh, for a, a more nuanced example of the restart process relative to uh, the child care restart. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sherling. One of the things that we thought would be important is sort of walk you through an example of uh, what goes into the various discussions that we have. And so I, I chose childcare because there was some interest in that. And secondly, um, there it, this is something that will be coming online on June 1st. Let me, as, let me sort of um, take you back to the week of March tw uh, 21st when we didn't know uh, what trend the virus was going to take. And I said, we must plan for the uh, worst case scenario. And that was a really pivotal week. Uh, during that week, um, the stay at home, stay safe order was issued and all childcare centers were closed except those programs that could offer services to um, essential workers. And I want to, I want to congratulate Vermont. I, I, I sort of want to pat the state on uh, on its back because Vermont took the highly unusual step of instituting a program that utilized state and federal funding to replace the revenues that the child care providers normally would receive from families and pub and publicly funded child care subsidies. And what Vermont did was put in place a $12 million dedicated child care, what is called a child care stabilization fund uh, or payment. Um, that was established to ensure that when the economy was ready to begin to reopen, and we knew that, um, that child care was going to be very, very important of that reopening, that, that it had to be there that the infrastructure had to be there. 
So we did institute the stabilization payment program, a component of which was an incentive uh, for uh, payment for pre-K and pre-K to eighth grade children of essential workers. And this program was, um, I think the senators should take some pride in this. The, this program was lauded nationally for its innovation and the payment structure that it that it used. In fact, um, I just received an article. I don't know if I have. Yeah, I do. I just received an article from the Center for um, American Progress, not a Republican uh, uh, publication. For for example, it's a fairly progressive uh, uh, publication where they highlighted Vermont uh, for its proposal. And Governor Scott was the only Republican mentioned out of the uh, five governors that were highlighted. Now, as we start to restart the economy, and childcare is an important part of restarting the economy, um, those stabilization grants will, uh, those stabilization payments will start going away. And, but Vermont has stepped up even more uh, into that. So we had the $12 million of stabilization uh, payments that we had uh, budgeted for, plus now the $6 million, what we call, uh, what we call restart grants that will assist uh, various centers with the restart. And, and again, these child centers are critical to uh, any restart effort because workers need childcare. In addition, we reached out um, to various uh, organizations, Bright Fu Building Bright Futures, Let's Grow Kids, and other community partners to get their input on what was going to be needed in terms of this, uh, this restart. Um, and we heard a couple of things that we have been working on to help with this restart. One was the payment structure to help with supplies, for example, and the $6 million that we have done on restart grants can help with supplies. But not only that, helping with access to supplies um, through, uh, bulk po uh, uh, through bulk purchasing and working with the SEOC, the State Emergency Operations Command, trying to help them and guide um, the, the supplies of cleaning supplies that are going to be needed uh, for this restart. The other one that we heard quite a bit about was um, dealing with flexibility in the payment process. Just to get a little bit technical, before the, pay, uh, the pandemic, um, we reimbursed child care centers on attendance. During the pandemic, we reimbursed them on enrollment because that we could base a steady stream of stabilization payments on what, what they had for normal enrollment uh, during that time. We are transitioning back to um, what is called a uh, attendance-based program. And given the, what the first month will be like, there'll be some, we have offered some flexibility in terms of what we can do with coding and various things like that um, with the payment structure as we move forward. Lastly, and I'll let uh, Dr. Kelso and uh, Dr. Levine chime in if they want, but this was very data and health driven in terms of this decision on June 1st. Um, because frankly, uh, June 1st, we're going to be opening up uh, childcare for right now, they're at 10, we'll be opening up to 25 per classroom uh, as we move forward. And so this was making sure that this guidance reflected not only the guidance for child care centers, but what, what will be the guidance June 1st for the general public as well in terms of gatherings. And the health department is confident that the health and safety measures in place really align with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention recommendations and will protect the uh, children and the workers. In fact, um, I've said this in a couple of news conferences, um, uh, national care organizations or national child care organizations are using Vermont's guidance all over the country as an example. And the decision to open 
and I can't emphasize this enough, was data-driven and epi, um, epi-guided uh, as, we moved, as we moved forward. Vermont right now, knock on wood, has a very low level of viral spread and a strong public health, as we've seen, a very strong public health system in place to uh, contain future outbreaks. In fact, uh, Dr. Kelso and her team, we tested um, various scenarios the other day just to make sure that we're keeping sharp on our ability to respond to any sort of future outbreak. Um, the other consideration that went into place was that the hidden sort of pandemic, what, I, what we would call the hidden pandemic, which is the uh, the impact of isolation on on child care, on all child care provider, uh, on all the emotional and developmental needs of children, particularly our most vulnerable children. And health is there also, we made it known that health is there to provide technical assistance and support for all child care providers in camps. We have a direct phone line and support staff for them. So, and again, I, I just want to emphasize, all of this planning for reopening um, in, co in coordination with uh, the uh, Child Development Division here at a AHS, um, we included a comprehensive input from pediatricians, uh, Building Bright Futures, Let's Grow Kids, and other community partners who all agree this is the right thing to do for kids. Um, so the focus was on health and data, and then what can we do to make it easier with the $6 million grants, um, the $6 million grant proposal that we have, or the grant program that we have put in place, plus trying to assist them with various things like fine, uh, supplies and flexibility and finance. So I just wanted to give you an example of all the things that went into place um, from those days that when we closed a child care, uh, care centers, except for those that were providing for essential workers, what we put in place, which was fairly significant and what we're putting in place now to work through the transition and how we looked at this as we were looking through the transition. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Lindsay, uh, Sec Secretary Curry. Sorry. <laughs> you can call me Lindsay. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, uh, just to you know, kind of dovetail off that, at the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, we are obviously working very much in trying to get employers open safely um, in the right timely fashion. And so from sort of kind of taking it way back at, as uh, Secretary Smith mentioned earlier, you know, going back to when we closed down, we, we very quickly closed down in-person business functions. And when we tried to help employers comply with that, we realized that it was, um, it made sense to give sector guidance. So we created very quickly sector guidance and made a website where folks could go and get information about that. And as we started to open up, it, it didn't always make sense to just do it by sector, right? Because um, you've probably heard, you know, we, we've phased it in the sense of, you know, groups of 10, for example, or at 25%. And Behind the scenes, we have a team, um, not just the team at ACCD, but you've all heard about the Economic Mitigation Task Force that the governor put together. And we have action teams there. It's a, it's a small group. Um, each team, action team has five or six members. And on the restart action team, they are literally going out and gathering intel from industry and sectors about how they work. And they document it and they work with them to propose what a phased opening would look like. So um, you can fill in the blank, whether it's a marina or a gym or a realtor or a restaurant, they created these plans. And the idea behind the plans wasn't that they could choose when they opened, but it was to have the plans so that we would have intel about how they operate 
so that we could then bring it to our discussions with um, health and safety. So we have a variety of these drafted plans. And when we get together with health and safety and we understand what we can consider opening, we try to figure out which, um, which uh, types of business, in-person business functions we can start letting back to work or permitting back to work and what kind of falls in these, in these buckets. So as you've seen, we had construction went back to work. Um, again, you saw like a really slow phase where they had a couple people and then they had five people and they had 10 people and now they're, they're working at um, full capacity. But again, it's very different because in order to, to do your phased opening, you also have to be able to comply with the health and safety requirements that have been put in place over and above everything they've, they've always been required to do. There are new requirements related to COVID-19. So if an employer is unable to, even though they may be permitted to restart at a certain fate, you know, at a certain um, capacity, I guess, if they don't feel that, or if they can't operate in the manner that is compliant with our expectations, then they're asked to continue to um, keep their in-person business functions suspended until they can get to that place. So um, we, you know, I'll just give you an example. I'm jumping around a little bit, but we had a municipal clerk, for example, who had reached out originally when we went to low or no contact professional services and we said you could operate one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and, you know, the clerk reached out and said, I don't know if you know my setup, but I can't, I, you know, I can't possibly do that. I can't adhere to the six foot. There was a whole, you know, a host of sort of, I'm not sure how I do that. And I wrote back and I said, let me just assure you when we permit you to go back into business, we or back into business functions, we want to make sure that you're complying. We don't want, this isn't a, um, you must, this is you're permitted so long as you can meet these, these requirements. And I talked to her a little bit about some creativity and some things that I knew some other town clerks had done. And Two days later, she wrote me and said, thank you, I figured it out. We're, you know, I'm feeling better about it. We feel safe, we're able to operate. So that's like the, the aspect that ACCD is working. And again, everything that we um, bring to the table in terms of what might be next is, as, as you're hearing, is very much vetted with health and safety. So um, there's nobody in ACCD that's just making these determinations of, you know, who to send out next and, and whatnot, but it's, it very much comes down to how you work and can you operate and, you know, operate in a way that will continue to mitigate the spread and um, keep the risk very low. So with that, I know. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> sorry, I can't remember who we agreed would follow me up. Doc, we doc, are, Carrie, we are going to Drs. Levine and Kelso okay. at the discretion of course. Mark, you're on mute. How's that? Perfect. Don't ask me how these things happen sometimes. <laughs> um, so in the interest of getting you to your question session, which I know you want to get to, I will just be very brief as a uh, Secretary, as Commissioner Sherling um, alluded to, to even begin this process, we needed to go through what we call the gating criteria. And those involve basically having a downward trajectory over a 14 day period of various health related statistics, including things like less incidence of cases, lower percent positivity rate of tests, lower um, syndromic surveillance data of who's presenting with what symptoms in, in our communities. So that was the first. The second had to do with making sure that the healthcare system was not uh, at a surge level or in danger of being at a surge level with its capacity being challenged. And that clearly we never got to. Third was to have adequate testing capacity meaning that at the very least we could do the number of tests per day we said we should be able to. And from a research standpoint, it would be appropriate for Vermont to do 
slightly less than a thousand tests per day. And uh, we actually exceeded that yesterday, but the bottom line is we uh, have the capability to do that in terms of all the components of the testing system being in place. And then the fourth is to have adequate contact tracing capability. That's basically a manpower thing. Um, and the amount of manpower can be quite large if there's a big outbreak because uh, it's a very laborious labor intensive process, which we've actually made even more labor intensive because we've expanded the timeline of people's memory. People have to remember not just 48 hours ago where they were, if they happen to be considered a case, but 14 days uh, so that we can really uh, try to figure out what was going on when they might have first acquired the virus, who they were with, what circumstances, et cetera. So that was a very important part of our deliberation. And the only other point I'll make, uh, I think you've probably gotten the message by now, uh, all of these restart groups and all of the people working on various sectors, um, one of the governor's prime criteria, and he says this every time he talks about things, is that uh, we examine the impact on the public's health and safety. And it's Commissioner Sherling and myself and Dr. Kelso being a big part of the whole process. Um, we are certainly not a power hungry health department, but I'm impressed with the amount of diligence that's um, been paid to making sure that any decisions that are made are made in a public health um, vision, if you will, taking into account all the considerations and concerns we might raise uh, before the trigger is pulled on some decision. So I'll just stop there um, so that you can proceed on with some of the more specifics of what you'd like to hear from us. Uh, who's up next? Well, unless Dr. Kelso would like to add anything to that or has any other independent comments you'd like to um, just to make a, um, a couple comments to add on to what Dr. Levine said, um, I feel very fortunate to be working on this pandemic in Vermont because I hear from my counterparts in other states that their government and leadership don't pay as much attention to public health and data. So I think um, we're lucky here. Everything is very data driven. In addition to the things, the metrics that Dr. Levine mentioned, we're looking at what's happening in states around us because they potentially pose a threat to what's happening in Vermont as people move around. Um, and he mentioned, you know, we're asking all of our cases to think back to the 14 days prior to their onset because that's the time frame in which they were infected. And we're trying to identify for as many cases as we can what their possible source of infection was. Because the proportion of our cases for which we don't know where they acquired the infection is another important metric that we're keeping an eye on. And I'll, I'll just stop there. Can I, um, can I just mention one thing? I'm not, I'm not supposed to talk, but, but I, I, just want to, uh, I just want to point out uh, something that Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso did last night. We processed 13, over 1,300 uh, tests last night for, um, uh, you, you know, in terms of testing. Uh, that's a phenomenal amount of tests that they did last night. And uh, it is, is something that I just wanted to point, point out what, what, uh, what has been transpiring. Um, you know, I, I will say this, I just went down to look at some, a board uh, down in a, what we used to call the war room down here. Um, and on March 22nd, I think it was March 22nd, we were looking at only two days of supplies of tests left. And now um, through innovation, through hard work, through um, luck, uh, we have had, uh, we have the ability now to test not only some symptomatic people, but asymptomatic people. And this is, uh, 
this is a lot different world than it was uh, just a mere uh, few weeks ago. So it is uh, something um, I just wanted to point out what they've done here. Thank you. Uh, are we going to hear from someone else or is that the end? I didn't know if we were hearing from uh, Mr. Pichak or if that's the everyone and we open up for questions. Commissioner Pichak is, is standing by to answer your nuanced data questions as okay. necessary. Okay, terrific. Well, then I think I'll send it, uh, turn it back to Senator Westman, who is going to manage uh, the Q&A. And um, first, I'd say thank you all for yeah. um, your presentations. And um, we're going to use the blue hand function. And um, Mark, you have a blue hand up. Uh, <laughs> you're muted. Do you have a question, Mark? Which Mark? McDonald. Senator oh, well, McDonald. I got to get rid of my blue hand then. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't have a question. I'm trying to get rid of my blue hand. But okay. Ignore um, it. So, so now we're open for questions. I, um, and I'm I don't see a blue hand, but I know she has questions. Um, um, Ruth, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, thank you, Senator Westman. And I was actually trying to find the list of questions I sent to you to refresh my memory, and I cannot find it. <laughs> but um, and, they've, and they've had your questions ahead. Yes, of time. I can tell they've had my questions. So thank you all for. Um, for, for answering a lot of my questions and for doing this. I think I was the first one to ask for this, um, this briefing. So it's been really, really helpful. And I, you know, overall just wanna commend you for the work you've done. Vermont is the envy of the country or at least anybody who cares about public health, it's the envy of the country. Um, and you all should feel really proud of that. I certainly do. Um, and uh, I, am, I appreciate hearing the point, the sort of process that you're going through. And one of the reasons I wanted to hear the process you're going through is because as you probably know, we have a lot of nervous and anxious constituents out here who are concerned about the process and being able to explain to them how decisions are being made and why decisions are being made is helpful. Um, and I, one of the things I, I've read a lot of, uh, of your, um, guidance. I've read more guidance in the past three months than I thought I ever would in my life. Um, and I, I also just want to, she's, she's not on the screen now, but um, Secretary Curley, um, just tell you how good your website is. I have sent your, I've sent your website link to dozens, hundreds probably of my constituents. It's a really great website. I really appreciate how you've set it up and it's easy to follow. And I definitely suggest that you talk to your colleagues, your counterparts at the Department of Labor and um, get them to do their website as, as nicely as yours because theirs is much, much harder to navigate. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Ruth. I'll share that with the team. I mean, I, I am proud of how quickly they've been able to put this up and make it, you know, rearrange it as, as needed, but it, it takes a lot of effort. So thank you. Yeah, it's really great. And I like the way that you've done it by sector. It's easy, you know, when I want to find somebody who's asking me about some random thing that I have no idea about, I almost always can find it. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, one of the things though, that is missing from a lot of the guidance and maybe um, Dr. Levine could speak to this is, guidance on what happens um, if there needs to be, if there's a case that's, you know, uh, an outbreak or even an individual case um, and what, what are the procedures, the process, the thresholds for going in the opposite direction. You talked about the gated period for opening up. What is it for going back knowing that you know, we're, we've been told by people like you that there's probably going to be a resurgence. So how, how are we going to go back into shutdown? What, what is your process for that? Yeah, that's a very commonly asked question. So I appreciate hearing that again, because um, it, it has a very nuanced answer, if you will. Uh, we are literally following so many pieces of data that we would hate to disproportionately focus on one item or one other item. We have told everyone that we will, forget about a resurgence, we will see more cases as we open up. The whole principle of 
physical distancing and staying at home is people can't be in contact with one another, so they won't be spreading an infectious disease. In this case, we are now bringing people back together in some ways, even though we would hope they would adhere to all of our guidelines about how to behave in a responsible way. The fact of the matter is, if you're going from group sizes less than 10 and starting to increase them, the likelihood of somebody being infected and spreading that to someone else becomes greater. So we do expect the number of cases to go up, not to a resurgence level, God forbid, unless the entire country sees a resurgence and will hopefully have seen that coming. But the bottom line is the whole notion of having adequate testing and adequate contact tracing is to make sure that when a individual case arises or when a small outbreak occurs, whether that be in a facility, in a prison, in a community, um, that we can immediately have the manpower to focus all the attention there. Isolate the person or persons who tested positive, do the appropriate contact tracing as intensively as you heard Dr. Kelso uh, comment on a moment ago with all those individuals, and then make sure that those people who through contact tracing appear to be capable of being infected and then themselves spreading the virus, make sure they are all quarantined. So if we can do that very effectively from the outset, we stand a great chance of being able to continue to reopen and expand. The principle here is that you need to have that workforce and that testing capability. So that's why we emphasize that so much and really make that a big focus of where we're going in the future. The country, as I've said a few times um, prior to today's meeting, the country wasn't able to contain the virus when it first arrived for a whole multitude of reasons, not the least of which um, there was some denial, but there was also uh, an issue of not having literally any taste testing capability at the time. So by the time the virus had really taken hold, containment though we tried it as a parallel strategy, couldn't be the only strategy that the country could use. And that's why we evolved into these harsher mitigation strategies, like you know, decreasing mass gatherings, social distancing, et cetera, and eventually to stay at home. Um, so the hope would be the next time around, every time a case appeared, you'd be able to do the effective uh, boxing in as it's called test, isolate, contact trace, quarantine, and still go on with life in the rest of the state because you've taken care of whatever you had to at that moment. Um, and that's, our, that's our real vision for the way the future will look uh, from now going forward, unless there is some major resurgence that occurs uh, in the country. Okay, well, thank you. Do you mind if I just follow up, Richie? Is, um, go ahead. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm thinking in the context of that, that's helpful, but in the context of, of a, a childcare center or a school or a university and college, whatever, those are much harder places to box it in. And, um, you know, just talking this morning with a childcare center who plans to open next week on June 1st, um, she's, I asked her that question, what's, what's your plan if somebody tests positive in your facility, whether it's a child or a staff member? And she said, I don't know, we haven't really been told what to do. Do we have to shut down for two weeks? And so I think that making sure that in the guidance that you're presenting to individual organizations or businesses or whatever, you're really clear to them about what is the protocol and specific to that type of business operation. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm on the education committee and I'm a mom. So I'm thinking really much a lot about colleges and schools and childcare centers. Um, yeah. And I think they in particular need more guidance in that area about what to do if there's a case. Um, you know, and, and, it's sort of like, when do you, when do you call a snow day? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we have a lot of experience with that based on what we've done with long-term care facilities and correctional facilities. Um, when any case appears that's positive, uh, what to do about testing, what to do about uh, isolation, 
how to function as a facility still. Um, and maybe I'll let Dr. Kelso chime in if she'd like, um, because we you're, you're speaking to guidance statements that are either pending or uh, will be coming in the very near future uh, that have to take what you took, uh, what you just stated into consideration. Great, thank you. Yeah, and as Secretary Smith um, referred to last Friday, we did a tabletop exercise to demonstrate what the EPI teams do um, with case investigation and contact tracing and demonstrating that we have capacity to do that. And I think people found it, um, people outside the EPI teams found it really helpful to really understand the work that public health does. Um, and we've talked about doing that presentation again for others. Um, it sounds like we should do that presentation for businesses and, and maybe just the public. Um, just to highlight what we do that we're on top of it. Um, you know, we had a handful of cases yesterday identified of the over 1000 tests and Secretary Smith reached out first thing in the morning to say, mm -hmm. you know, I see there were three cases in one county. Is there anything we need to be worried about? And by late morning, my epi teams had reached all the cases, knew all the details about where we think they were exposed or you know, whether they were associated with anything broader and we were able to reassure him. So we are that much on top of it. Um, and it, I think it might be helpful for more people to see that. Yeah, I would agree. I think that would be great. I would love to see that because I get a lot of questions about contact tracing and how it works. Um, and I'm not a public health expert, so. <laughs> okay. So um, the next hand I saw was Senator Polina and then Senator Lyons after that. Thank you. I appreciate everybody being here together. I have kind of a process question, which might seem a little bit similar to what Ruth Hardy was just asking about, but because I'm gonna use childcare as an example, you folks, made a decision, the team working on it made a decision to open child care centers June 1st. As the legislator, I get a lot of people contacting me who are concerned about that child care centers who are saying, I'm not sure I want to do it. I'm, there's a variety of reasons why I don't think it's a good idea. So what I'm wondering is whether or not, how you worked with different groups of people, in other words, not the experts, but well, the, the experts meaning the ones who actually are doing the work. I don't mean your team of experts. Um, how you worked with folks to come up with the decision to do June 1st, as an example, and make people feel comfortable with that. And if people are contacting me with concerns about opening up again, I presume some of them contacting you folks as well. And I'm wondering how you're going to keep open lines of communication going to as we evaluate what happens over the next couple of weeks. And, you know, there's some of it is the te technical stuff about whether people are going to get viruses or not. The other is some of the trauma that comes as a result of, for instance, young children having to spend the day with adult caregivers who are wearing masks, you know, those kinds of questions. So my question has to do with how you reached out to folks before you made your decisions, folks as members of the public, and how you maintain communication with folks as things go forward. I'll so just uh, start, Senator, by saying, it, regardless of the sector, there are split opinions on restart. Um, so uh, as we've described, most of the decision making comes through the public health lens. For the details on uh, whether it's child care or if you want another example on the engagement, I leave that to Secretary Smith or Secretary Curley. Let me, uh, uh, Senator Bellina, let me sort of um, discuss that a little bit. Uh, one of the things that we were really cognizant about, and I, and we'll do more of it as we continue, is making sure that we included uh, some groups in here in this that was just wasn't us that were making this decision. And as I said, we included uh, uh, Building Bright Futures, Let's Grow Kids, Community Partners, um, who sort of all agreed that this was the right thing to do for the kids. The, the one thing that we have been doing through Brina, through Brina Holmes, who is with the health department, uh, pediatrician with the health department and with CDD is reaching out, I, I believe, and I don't, this, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna test me with my technology, but reaching out through these forums to uh, make sure that everybody 
um, gets a voice and they can hear some of the thought process that's, that's going on. So we'll continue that process as we move forward to make sure that we're hearing voices out there. In fact, that's where we heard the issue about supplies. And that's where we heard the issue about flexibility and some of the finances aspect of it and trying to accommodate those as we move forward. The, and that's where uh, Brina Holmes um, has been just really, really good in talking about the health aspects of it and the, uh, the various uh, things to work through as we move forward. So I definitely appreciate the question and we got to continue to do that as we move forward. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I understand the difficulty of trying to corral these different various ideas and various concerns that people have and not project, present, presenting that, uh, pretending that it's easy to do. I mean, I think we've made some good progress. So I don't say that in a negative way, but I just, there's sometimes there's a disconnect between those of us who are dealing with government and those people who live in the real world. And I just want to make sure that we're not losing connections between the two. Yeah, I, Senator, I would ask Secretary Curley also to answer in part, uh, because I know that as we're crafting the actual guidance that goes into what ACCD releases, oftentimes it's sectors uh, and businesses that are writing components of that. We place that in the draft, and then that gets called through by the health experts. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes those uh, initial drafts are more restrictive than even the public health um, construct would uh, necessitate. So maybe Secretary Curley could walk through an example of that. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but I, you know, you'll be hearing an announcement tomorrow about the governor's been, been promising to talk about salons and barbershops. I can tell you that there's a, there's a, I don't want to say there's a divide, but there's a difference of opinion between many who operate within that field with respect to how they feel about opening. We have some that are very, very anxious to open and feel like they are, they live in a world of cleaning and constantly like cleaning surfaces, whatever it might be. And then there's, you know, a whole host of folks who are still anxious about it. And so when I look back at, you know, the teams that, that tried to figure out what a phased approach would look like um, in the salon slash barbershop, uh, teams the, the restart team engaged with more than a dozen people around the state there were um, there was an RN on the group there were folks that did different kinds of services within like salon you know the salon world so to speak so they, they were really really thorough and um, again what I tell people when they reach out whether they're anxious to open or they're anxious not to open I just try to help them understand that you know at the end of the day, we need to find a path forward to living while we, you know, work through this. And, you know, again, I have no clinical background, but short of a vaccine, I understand we all, we want to prioritize public health, but it, there's also a little bit of a balance in terms of, um, there, there's like a mental health aspect too. Like these are, this is what people enjoy doing. These are their hopes and dreams as well. And so we're just really trying to find a balance and don't want to put anybody at risk. So um, again, it, it's a lot of different effort going into it. And for me, I'm lucky that there's a backstop of, you know, Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, uh, Commissioner Sherling there to sort of say to me when I'm too far in the weeds for the employer, right, to say, okay, let's bring yourself back out. We've got to protect public health first. Right. And again, I just want to make sure that as we transition that we're all staying as much as possible on the same page. We've seen how in other parts of the country, transitions have not gone very smoothly in terms of people sticking together. I think one of the benefits of the way you were transitioning here in Vermont is that Vermonters are cooperating in a really good way with government officials. And I think we just wanna make sure that we stay on the same page as much as possible. We're not always gonna, obviously not everybody's gonna be happy with everything, but we wanna do as best as we can in terms of keeping people on the same page. Thank you. Yes, yeah. So um, next is Senator Lyons. And then um, Senator Campion um, is after that. Oh, great. Uh, actually, I was going to, I'm going to ask a, a question that none of us can answer maybe, but um, uh, so I'll save that one for next. But 
are, are very interested in the data tracking act, as, aspect of this and data collection and knowing that the health department has, a, apparently you have a huge capacity for data collection, but it seems to me that all the sectors are providing information to you. Uh, people who are working in their stores or out in the, in the real world outside of government. So what are, the, what are the data acquisition and data tracking needs that we have in the state that could improve um, the work that you're doing and the, and the outcomes? Uh, that, I mean, that's for all of you who are here. I greatly appreciate what you're saying. And, and just FYI, I do really very much admire the health department's website. <laughs> it's, uh, it's improved greatly over the past several years. But so is there, is there a need for uh, additional, and I include in that IT um, and data tracking capacity uh, in the state so that as we go forward, we're, we're covered. And I do have two, uh, another couple questions, but that, that's the first one. Okay, Patsy, do you want to do the, um, the, the, the introduction of the new technology that we're using? The SARA alert? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So we've partnered with the MITRE Corporation, which um, one of the leaders of that is Dr. Paul Jarris, who many of you rem remember as our former health commissioner. He's the medical director there. And they have worked as public health professionals and people who know what public health does to develop this app, um, which is free to health departments. And it, um, it allows us to enroll people who are either under quarantine because they've potentially been exposed to a case or who are under isolation because they are a case and to monitor them through a daily outreach through this app. So people choose whether they want their daily message to be through a text or a phone call or an email, then they'll get, depending on whether they're in isolation or quarantine, they'll get a daily message saying, you know, do you have any of the symptoms today or are your symptoms improving? Um, and it lets them, uh, it lets the health department check in with them every day to make sure they're still in quarantine, for example, or still haven't developed symptoms. Um, so we'll, we're implementing that app this week. Um, we had to do some mapping between our surveillance system and the app. Um, and there were some glitches, but we're uh, launching it today, I think. Um, we will also have a survey gizmo tool, I think, where returning Vermonters can um, go fill out some survey questions through this online survey gizmo tool, basically name and how they want to be reached. And then um, as they're in quarantine because they're just returning to Vermont, they'll be enrolled in the system. The survey gizmo will enroll them in the system and then they'll automatically start getting these daily messages. So we're using some new tools like that, which are really cool. Um, there are always needs for our lab information system. Um, you know, that's an ongoing challenge, um, but we've made a lot of progress in, in getting communication between our lab system and either other labs or the public health surveillance system. So we've done an awful lot and I'm amazed how um, Commissioner Pichek and, and ADS and others have really stepped up and pulled all kinds of other data sources from other states and you know the modelers. Um, we have access to tons of data that I never even knew existed. So it's been, it's been actually really great. So uh, with the, so with having, I'm, I know that Commissioner Pichak has been very much engaged in putting all that data together and getting information out. And what would, I mean, do we have sort of, are we establishing a model for this so that going forward when some of us are no longer here that we'll be able to replicate all that work? It sounds like a lot of human hours and human resource um, in the process. Well, I, I don't know if that's a question or a comment, and, and the, the, that's both. And then 
Uh, I do have a question about burnout and how long our Department of Health and, and public health folks and human services folks are gonna be able to continue at the rate um, because there is not an end yet. So just from a human resource perspective, I hope that everyone is healthy. And thank you for that concern. Um, that actually came up in several phone call, phone meetings in the last two days here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a physician. I come from a profession where burnout is one of the top discussed issues of our time. Um, and um, it was not an issue I heard about in public health, but clearly a pandemic can push people to that limit for sure. People in public health are so dedicated to their work, so committed, and they live for a pandemic, if I could say it that way. Well, this is what they want to be involved in. But most not epidemics, <laughs> most epidemics that occur, they sort of have a, a beginning and an end, and you can sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel or understand how they work. When you're dealing with this kind of lesser known virus that hasn't really uh, affected mankind before, it changes the game tremendously. Um, and when you look at the pace with which our knowledge is growing, and the pace with which things were evolving early on, and now even the pace of which we're trying to evolve to come out of this, still not completely certain about the more distant future, people in public health haven't stopped working the entire time. Uh, and we're becoming much more conscious of that. Uh, I'm conveying that message up to myself, if you will, uh, to make sure everyone else is aware of it too. Um, and within the department, uh, division directors and members of the uh, state and health operations centers are beginning to really look at schedules and trying to make sure that people actually have time on their schedule that they are not dedicated to the cause because it's been kind of a 24 seven thing for everybody where you feel you can't put your phone down, not look at another email, uh, close yourself off to text messages, et cetera. And the reality is we can't have people do that ad infinitum. So we're becoming much more conscious of that and we're going to be much more deliberate about trying to impact them. And, and Senator oh, Lane, yeah, my, my, wife, my wife keeps reminding me that I could be retired by now. But. Uh, so that sounds familiar. <laughs> they, and just uh, a tiny, tiny note, Senator, on your data question. Uh, Commissioner Pichek and I were actually talking this morning. Uh, there is an enormous amount of data, some of it through existing systems, some of it through ad hoc systems that we've stood up on the fly. and. We were talking about um, strategies to integrate that moving forward. Um, so it is on our mind as well. Yeah, I, I think it's, I'm glad that you're doing it. I know how hard you're working and how much is out there, but it certainly makes sense going forward to have some alignment um, and systems in place. I have one last question and you don't have to answer it. And I, I, I'm trying to, I continue to try to explain how this state has such a wonderful um, culture of cooperation. I think it begins with the people who are here with us um, today. And I really uh, do appreciate the work you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. That's Thanks, it. Je Thanks, Jenny. Um, um, Senator Campion and then Senator Ingram. Great, thank you. Uh, one question that I uh, have been hearing a lot down here in Bennington County is the mask issue and how uh, how people will transition back to you know regular life uh, what kind of protections they'll need and uh, I'm wondering if you could give some additional information on why you decided not to do a statewide policy on masks to me uh, one of the things that I think a lot of folks are concerned about is, you know, it's almost as we're putting that enforcement um, in the hands of businesses and they have so much going on, store owners, bookshops, all different folks. And if, a, you know, 
if they want to make sure that their workers are protected, we're kind of saying to them, you have to enforce it. And it seems to me a, a statewide policy might work better along those lines. So uh, I'll leave it there. I think one thing we try to establish in our press conferences is the fact that this really is a it's a behavior change like any other behavior change. And it's a more of a cultural norm change. Um, not that we ever thought cultural norm would be to wear masks. I mean, I think we could agree a cultural norm is to not smoke in a restaurant, but uh, maybe not wearing masks. So it does take a little time for people to evolve into that. Interestingly, I did look at a survey today that came from the National Response Coordination Center and the CDC conducting this uh, public perception study of mitigation behaviors. 86% of the public reported that the current social distancing guidelines strikes the right balance. 75% would not feel safe if restrictions were removed. 80% report having worn a mask in the last week. Now that's nationwide. I can't tell you what our number is in Vermont, uh, I don't think we have that data specifically, except my informal surveys of visits to the supermarkets and big boxes. But um, I think we're evolving in the right direction. And I think that you're right. There have been calls for this to be more uh, legislated, I guess would be the word, uh, whether it be through an executive order or through the legislature, or as was done in Burlington this week, through the city council, essentially saying that um, to be in any government building or in any retail establishment, you have to have facial covering on. Um, we, I think the governor and uh, uh, we were hoping that it wouldn't come to uh, having to be that impactful on people, that pressure, just peer pressure, social pressure and normalization as part of our culture. Uh, would, would be the uh, way to go. Still remains to be seen um, if, if that will be a successful strategy or not. I, I have to say that the number of states that have actually um, done something more strict, I think I can count on one hand or less. Um, it's not become a widely um, enforced or mandated uh, policy uh, around the country at this point. Um, but we'll right. So I, I think we started the conversation off a little bit by talking about how the administration is basing decisions in science and on fact and data. And I, I felt like what you just said was, you know, sort of public perception, cultural changes, you know, shifts, that kind of thing. But as the chief public health officer, I'm wondering, do you believe that, you know, masks should be, you know, a statewide policy and that whether or not they, that would help keep our numbers lower? You know, I believe masks should be adopted widely. Uh, okay. I wouldn't recommend it if there wasn't any uh, evidence that right. they're effective. Um, right. The real question, though, is, is there evidence that a policy created in the way you describe mm -hmm. would improve compliance and adherence more than what we're trying to do, which is be more um, generous about allowing the public to get there. Um, yeah, and I take your point. It's a good one. I, I just, you know, shopkeepers and others, it's, it's sort of like a lot of things we can't enforce. You know, we have a 21, a smoking age of 21, uh, but, you know, it's not as though we can, we're going to pull people over that look like they're you know, uh, not of age, or it's just a tricky thing. But I think when the enforcement policy is out there, people take it more seriously. Um, yeah, and I'm, so, I'm completely with you on that. And yeah. I'll, I'll use smoking again as an example. You know, we can't tell people who are under 21, you know, you cannot smoke. Uh, like you said, they may do what they want to do, mm -hmm. no matter what enforcement policy we have. But somehow, Everyone now gets the fact that you don't walk into a bar, restaurant, or any indoor establishment and light up. Um, we've achieved that in our society. 
Um, can we achieve the same during this pandemic? Uh, where I consider the stakes to be pretty high. Uh, right. That's what we're going to find out. Right. I just would push back a little bit. You know, smoking has taken a long time for the culture to change. This is a pandemic. Uh, we're not looking at having years to change. We have a very brief period of time, I would say, to, to change. Okay. And this is where I think a, a statewide policy would be helpful. But thank you. It's very helpful. Senator Ingram and then Senator Hooker. Thank you. Um, uh, in Senate Education, we spoke um, about a week or so, I, I can't, I lose track of the days, but uh, a, a while ago <laughs> to the Secretary um, uh, of uh, the Agency of Education. And um, I, I wonder if you have been um, in discussions with, with him, with that agency, um, and what you envision um, since schools are by nature, by their very nature, congregate settings, um, uh, do you think it, it's really going to be possible for us to open up in the fall? What will that look like? Will, will classrooms have to have like half the number of students or um, do you have any, any ind indicators about how that might, will all the students be required to wear masks? Um, any, any indication what the thinking is on that? So it turns out three o'clock tomorrow is a meeting myself with Dr. Brina Holmes, with Dan French, and a number of others from his department uh, to address exactly what you said, uh, because we really regard it as time to, to, to really look at this. No one's talking about opening schools tomorrow or anything as we know. The school year has already been predetermined to have ended and uh, no one's going back to the classroom uh, this spring. So um, we're taking our lead from um, some good uh, creative thinkers around the country who have really said, we need to have input from all sectors. So public health, education, obviously, uh, the pediatric sector, the child psychology sector uh, so that we can evaluate not only what the benefits might be of returning children to the school, but what the harms might be of not returning them to the school. Sort of akin to the discussion on child cares where there's some benefit to keeping children out of child care if you're thinking that they might get infected there, but at the same time, is the social isolation that they encounter and experience outweighed by the benefits they might get by being again in a congregate setting where they can actually emotionally and socially develop the way that we all want them to develop in that positive way, but maybe are being held back from because they can't be in those settings. So there's so many things to balance on both sides of the equation. And that's why we're starting these discussions in May, as opposed to at the end of August, um, to really put all that on the table and help us make decisions. As you know, uh, the decisions to open schools have been made in some states, but not many. Um, and they were one of the later things we did in our evolution of uh, the mitigation measures we took. But it happened, actually, it wasn't that late. It happened fairly quickly. Um, but we're gonna be very deliberate about the way we decide to return them if we do. Um, it's, it's very, very challenging to be honest um, for all the reasons you listed. Um, and that's why we wanna have very, very diverse input, uh, not just make this a public health issue and an education issue because there's so much more to it. I don't know if anyone else in my uh, group here has anything to say on, on that topic. Looks like I'm Senator Hardy wants to follow up too. So excuse me. Just I'll quickly add that it, at um, two thirty today we got an update from CDC that they have updated guidance on considerations for schools reopening um, that just got posted to the CDC website. So we haven't read it yet. Okay. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> You've had two and a half hours already. What are you? What have you been doing? <laughs> Uh, Richie, may I follow up with Senator Ingram's question? Or did you have somebody else in line? I don't want to budge. 
Uh, but it, yeah, there's um, a couple of people in, in line and then um, we are gonna go maybe 10 minutes more and then we're done. So, but if you're quick. Uh, well, I just wanted to say, first of all, um, that I'm really glad that you're having the conversations early on um, schools and starting now with that conversation because it's extremely complicated. Um, I'm thrilled to hear that Brina Holmes is involved in that. I actually have a call with her tomorrow. She was my children's pediatrician when they were young. So I have a great faith in her. So thank you for having her in on that conversation. Um, I also would just suggest that you bring parents and kids into that conversation this summer. I think kids will be able to help you understand compliance issues and how much they're going to comply with whatever regulations or guidance you set up. Um, I have three teenagers and I can tell you their level of compliance would vary greatly. Um, so I just really encourage you to not just include the quote unquote experts, but include the, the experts of child behavior, which are the children and the teenagers themselves. Um, and that my final comment was just the, the timeline. Um, uh, some of the guidance seems to come out and then say the next day you can open up X, Y, or Z. Um, and that sometimes is really problematic. So having this long lead time for colleges and universities and schools is crucial. So thank you. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Cheryl. A little, a little of what we've been doing has had the uh, benefit of such a timeline. Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you all for everything that you're doing. Um, Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso, I'm, I'm so pleased to see the expanding of testing, but this testing only shows whether or not we're positive. Do you have any idea when the serology or the antibody testing will be more widely available? I'm waiting uh, momentarily to get the second report of the work group that I assigned to, to this topic made up of uh, infectious disease experts at the university, made up of laboratory medicine experts in the health department and the university and health surveillance experts. Um, but uh, I can give you a little bit of a preview. The preview will be that unlike the first report, this report will say that there are now actually some assays we can rely on, uh, that their validity has uh, been actually analyzed and they are satisfactory to use uh, so that we don't question the accuracy of the tests that we're gonna be implementing. Um, they will probably still say that for individual behaviors, like will this tell you that you have, uh, are immune to the virus? Will this tell you you can go back to work? They're probably We have not reached that stage where the test should be used in that manner. And that the test will, still be of value for a population level survey, uh, health surveillance, understanding what percentage of the Vermont population has had potential exposure to the virus, whether they had symptoms or not, uh, which will really go a long way towards in the future, understanding risk levels and understanding uh, based on our prior experience with the virus, what we might expect in the next go round if there was a res significant resurgence. So um, I'm waiting for the final report. I assume at one of the press conferences next week, I'll be able to actually provide that report publicly um, and we'll go from there. Excellent. And we've been in consultation with the Centers for Disease Control just in terms of getting some preliminary uh, word on advising us if we wanted to do what's called a zero prevalence study uh, of the state uh, with, a, with a sample of the state, obviously. Um, and we're going to see if they're interested in working with us on that to any degree as well. Excellent. And a second question regarding um, the impact of isolation. We've talked about daycare centers and we've talked about kids at school. And I know that there's a vulnerable population that is really impacted by this isolation. And I, I applaud the state for what happened with um, nursing homes and uh, long-term care facilities, because I'm sure that it's kept a lot of people uh, healthy. But is there anything that's being um, done or thought about to help people in this vulnerable group? One of the things that's 
rather interesting is to hear about all of the places, countries around the world, and even states that are opening up. But if you're in that vulnerable group, you should probably stay home. So what are we going to do for these vulnerable people who um, will you know, still be at risk? And what can we do to help them to deal with the um, impact of this isolation? Yeah, I don't want to do all the talking and prevent Dr. Kelso from talking. So I'll just say one quick thing. Commissioner Hutt of Dale uh, is working with us very closely because we are very concerned just from a compassion laden basis uh, for our citizens who are in long term care facilities and have not been able to visit with their families and vice versa, obviously, um, and trying to capitalize on warmer weather outdoors. Uh, and trying to connect people more than they have been able to to this point in time. So expect some movement on that front in the near future, we hope, uh, because that will keep them mentally much more healthy. But for someone like yourself, who's actually free living in a community, um, but still concerned and perhaps anxious and wanting to take the advice about age being a part of vulnerability, um, I do think what we've said to date is really important in terms of um, abiding by all the usual things like hygiene and social distancing and covering of faces. But in addition to that, really thinking about who uh, is a trusted uh, friend, a trusted household. And we use the word trusted to mean they too take everything seriously and are abiding by things so that people can start to get together again, um, rather than be afraid of each other um, and afraid of those circumstances. But yeah, unfortunately, uh, vulnerable populations are gonna be among the last to have the, the restrictions lifted entirely. Um, we are meeting with um, Commissioner Hutt on Tuesday to talk about um, you know, moving forward if we can with nursing homes. Um, and until we have a vaccine, I think, unfortunately, uh, the recommendations are largely going to be that vulnerable populations, whatever they are, um, need to take extra precautions. Rich, can I um, ask a, 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 a very quick follow up to that? Or uh, quick, quick. It is quick. I, in the area of vulnerable uh, folks, uh, there are many who have uh, autoimmune diseases and, and related um, vulnerabilities who might work, uh, for example, for the state. Or, and are we going to encourage them to continue their work remotely until such time as we have some comfort within the workplace or a vaccine? Uh, I am concerned about this for vulnerable populations, people who might look normal and can go to <laughs> regularly do work, but how do we, and I see Lindsay turned, I was going to direct this actually both to Lindsay and the rest of you, all of you. I mean, it's, to me, it's an important question. I, um, I, this question came up during a press conference, um, maybe about two weeks ago, and I heard the governor in this the Secretary of Administration said, we will make accommodations for those people um, that are vulnerable, that have autoimmune uh, issues, that feel that uh, will be vulnerable if they come back to work at state government. So I, I'm, I'm using the exact same answer that Secretary Young gave is, we'll, we'll make accommodations for those. I was gonna say the same thing. <laughs> So um, I think um, we're approaching then maybe um, 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 five minutes more, um, but I wanna shift gears a little bit. Um, and since this is the transition committee, um, um, I, and we know that the administration is gonna have a package, an, e um, an economic package to begin to move businesses um, to, um, um, open up and it's a pretty significant package. Lindsay, could you um, speak a little bit um, because we haven't really had a chance to um, hear all the pieces of that. Could you from a very high level talk about that? 
Are you you're talking about the economic relief package we announced yes. yesterday? Oh, yes. okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I I didn't know we were going to go here today. Um, yeah, we unveiled a four hundred million dollar um, economic relief package that we're proposing that would um, essentially uh, provide financial assistance to the many Vermont employers who have been either completely closed or partially closed during uh, the last month. And I, I guess we're going into month three now, but um, the idea behind it was we, we gathered a lot of intel about impact. And while we know that the, the impact is greater probably than we have uh, funds for, we are hopeful that we put something together that would help employers cover three months of their fixed costs. Um, so we thought that, you know, there, you know, when you, you're suspending business, there's certain things that you can shut down in terms of your cost, but there are other things you can't, you can't control. So even if you can defer some things, your utilities or whatnot, eventually when you're ready to turn the lights back on, you've got to, you know, catch up on those things. So that's a big, big bulk of that package. So the initial phase is 310 million. So I think it's around 250 million um, would be specifically to help uh, cover those costs as well as give some loans for some other, you know, aspects of getting them, them back off the ground. And then there's a technical assistance piece of it. So there's a component of knowing that we just don't have enough um, resources to make sure we help these employers navigate not only our programs, but the federal programs, and also reimagining how they deliver their services. So um, when we permit folks to go back to work, it's very, uh, very unlikely it's going to be business as they knew before, right? So they have to make adjustments with the layout, you know, the architecture, the design of whether it's their store, their restaurant. I'm talking really fast because there's a lot of this to cover. I don't want to take up too much time on it, but. Well, it, 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 I think it's important for you to get it out so we have okay. a broad view of this. Okay. And then um, also there's an employee assistance uh, program, sorry, um, employee assistance program that would uh, be offered to employers, nonprofits and whatnot, uh, kind of like we have at the state. In the state, we have an opportunity if, if an employee is struggling with whatever it might be, they can go talk to somebody. And um, in this situation, it would be business owners, their employees, as well as their family members. So sometimes, you know, when they have these conversations, it surfaces that there's a family member struggling in the home as well. So it would extend to their um, so that's the technical assistance piece. Then we have a housing, um, and in the housing, uh, we have a rental stabilization fund that we're trying that uh, for 42 million, and this would provide up to three months of emergency rental assistance and rental arrearage payments to property owners who are suffering from non-payment of rent. Um, to prevent tenant evictions and you know prevent an increase in family homelessness. So um, there's that in terms of housing. There's also something uh, called the Rehousing Recovery Fund. So this would be $8 million set aside for emergency housing rehabilitation grants and forgivable loans um, to make up 250 units of housing available to rehouse homeless families who are experiencing homelessness during this outbreak. So um, that's the housing piece. And then the last piece, so that's 50 million total. And the last piece is the marketing, 5 million. And what we you know, are looking at with, with marketing is that you know, we generally rely on out-of-staters to, to boost you know, the second largest sector in our state, tourism. And obviously with the sort of unknown of when we'll be able to invite people back to enjoy our state, we wanna make sure that we're encouraging Vermonters to look inward and try to help each other. So. We want to, you know, promote economic activity within our, within our state and consumer spending in the downtowns and really try to give an immediate boost from Vermonters or people that are within our state um, to keep folks going and to start generating, gener and start generating tax revenue. Um, we also have regional marketing and consumer stimulus grants. And the idea with that is to um, encourage grant funds. Uh, uh, communities, uh, might be chambers or local downtown associations, 
to come together and, and make a proposal to us about how they would spend a grant to, uh, again, kickstart the, the economy in their area. And the idea on that is, you know, we from the state can create tools that could be shared broadly, but different parts of our state really are different, right? And they rely on different things in terms of their, their tourism and, and um, their economy right within their community. So the idea is a grant payment to the region that would allow them to um, be creative and, and stimulate um, economic activity within their community. So that's a really quick overview of, of the plan. There's a phase two, and that's really more about this right now is survival. Like, let's keep the lights on. Let's get people through this because um, if we lose all these employers, we lose downtowns, we lose jobs, we lose it, you know, trickle down, it just carries on. So we need to survive. And then in the next phase, um, once we're seeing how people are doing, we really want to make sure that we um, become innovative and, and creative and make sure that we emerge stronger than ever. So there's going to be a lot more to come on this. Um, and, you know, we can certainly bring the, the team ACC as well as the ag team together to, to present on this further so and uh, and I'm sure you'll be hearing from all of us about that at this point we've been going for an hour and a half and I think um, um, I'm going to say thank you um, to everyone in the administration that has um, come and done presentations Brian do you want to add anything no, just thank you. This was just terrific. Thanks so much. And Lindsay, I just have a follow up with you, but I can do it offline. Uh, maybe you can just send me, uh, I'll send you an email. Just to yeah, point. that'd be great. I have another meeting now, but yep, if we it's could no rush. It's a, okay. it's a question. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank great. you all so much. Thank so you. Thank you, all thank so you much. everyone. Keep up the Bye. good work. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.